Awesome. All right. Well, hey, y'all at home. My name is Kelsey Dillo. I'm the gallery manager here at Aramont School and Arts and Crafts. Um, Happy New Year and welcome to our instructor roundtable series. Since July of 2020, this series has aimed to highlight the talented artists who teach at Aramont and to introduce new ideas of contemporary craft and to strengthen the connections within our community. I want to remind our guests at home that they're going to be muted during our chat today, but we encourage you to post questions throughout the discussion in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We're going to do our best to get to as many of these questions as we can at the end of our conversation today. More information about our panelists will be shared in the chat bar, and today's discussion will be posted on our website and YouTube channel later in the week. So today we're talking with three artists who are scheduled to teach, to teach introductory workshops at Aramont in the coming 2021 national workshop season. Check out the 2021 workshop descriptions that can be found on our website. Early registration opens February 1st. So our panel today includes Chris Haley, Wood Turner and Studio Tech at Denver Tool Library based in Denver, Colorado. Amy Patansu, weaving artist and professor based in Waynesville, North Carolina and Amy Taylor, natural dyer and small business owner based in Chicago, Illinois. So our panelists are gonna each have a chance to introduce themselves and then we're gonna jump straight into some thoughts and questions on today's topic. Chris, would you like to start us out with an introduction to you and your work and about the workshop that you're scheduled to teach at Aramont this year? Sure, um, thanks Kelsey and uh, Thank you for uh, having me here in this panel. It's, uh, you know, I'm always happy to do um, anything I can to support Aramont. Uh, I started my um, personal journey as a, a woodworker, as an artist about, um, I guess it's about 16 years ago now. Um, and I, I began learning woodworking at a local community college we have in town here, Red Rock School of Fine Woodworking, uh, Red Rocks Community College, and then they have a Red Rock School of Fine Woodworking as a part of that. Um, and I, you know, I originally got involved because I, I had just bought my first house in 2005, and I was looking around for furniture and just you know didn't really like anything um, that I saw. And um, I always used to paint and draw a lot in high school. So I started sketching out little ideas of, uh, you know, coffee tables and things that I wanted to make. And then at that time, I, you know, somewhere along the line of making those sketches and looking around for furniture, I remembered that Red Rocks had a woodworking program. So I thought, well, why don't I just go enroll in that for a semester or two and I'll make myself a table or some things. And um, in the beginning, that's all it was going to be. It was just going to be that, you know, one semester, um, make a table, and then that was it. Uh, you know, long story short, I, I totally fell in love with woodworking, um, and it's, uh, you know, wound up taking uh, five years worth of evening classes there one at a time. I still had a full-time day job at the time, so I was, you know, just doing like a class or two a semester. Um, and about two or three years into that, I had my first wood turning class, my first class working with the lathe. Um, and, <laughs> and it was all over at that point, you know, I mean, you know, like I said, I got into it originally building furniture and at some point I started, you know, like entertaining the notion of maybe becoming a furniture maker, you know, making custom furniture for people. But as soon as I got in front of the lathe, I, that, that all went out the window and it, you know, it was all woodworking, you know, ever since then. Um, you know, so since that time, since the five years at Red Rocks, once I had kind of, you know, gone through that program and you know I, I repeated some of the woodwork or uh, wood turning semesters a couple times because you you know you can do that you can kind of just keep keep taking that semester um, <clears throat> from there I started taking classes at places like Anderson Ranch Arts Center and Aeromont and uh, Center for Furniture Craftsmanship because one thing that's kind of unique about the wood turning world is we don't really have um, you know, university programs. Like if I had wanted to go get um, a BFA in wood turning, that's something that's, I mean, I think there might be like one program in the whole country um, that I keep hearing rumors about, but um, you know, by and large, we don't, we don't have that option. So, I mean, for us, especially places like um, Aeromont and Anderson Ranch and Center for Furniture Craftsmanship, Penland, you know, all the arts and craft schools are so important for us because that's that's what gives us in the in the wood turning world kind of that um you know experience that a, a lot of other people would get from a bfa program so um you know just kind of started doing that um when you know i think i've 
probably been to about seven or eight of these week-long workshops. And um, for the last, uh, you know, ending, I, I have to catch myself from saying last summer, Deborah and I were talking about this earlier, you know, it feels like last summer, but it's really been two years ago now. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at Arrowmont um, and I was uh, uh, Jack Vessery's assistant. I've been his assistant three times and, um, you know, uh, so um, somewhere in there, I, I decided to, uh, you know, go ahead and, and make the leap to, to quit the full-time day, day job and become a, a, a full-time wood turner. And I made that leap in 2019, right before all this stuff went down with the pandemic. So it was kind of, a, kind of unfortunate timing, but, um, you know, I I'm still, uh, still had some positive things go on last year. I got into a real good gallery here in Denver and had a successful solo show in July. Um, so between, you know, that and, um, you know, things like the Aeromont class getting rescheduled to this next summer, there's been like a few, uh, you know, little uh, rays of hope in there to kind of keep me going this year. And, and now I'm just kind of looking forward to next year. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's my recent history in a, in a nutshell there. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Chris. Amy P? Mm -hmm. Um, hi, uh, thanks, Kelsey. Thank you, Aromont. Um, good to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me to this talk. Um, <clears throat> oh, Chris, I am familiar with um, Jack Vessery and the Center for Maine um, Furniture Craftsmanship because I'm originally from Maine. Now I live in Western uh, North Carolina for the past 13 years, but coastal Maine is like near and dear to my heart. Um, many, many years ago, I knew Jack because we were both um, members on the board of the Maine Crafts Association. So um, small world. Uh, anyway, um, I'm, a, I'm a hand weaver, I'm a textile maker, um, and I learned to weave at Rhode Island School of Design in the early 90s. I got my BFA there, um, earned that in 1995. And ever since, I've been um, weaving or at the very least involved in craft in one capacity or another um, um, in a variety of jobs and pursuits. For the past 13 years, I have been um, teaching full-time faculty at Haywood Community College in the professional crafts program, uh, which is a very cool two-year program. Um, associate's degree program with areas in fiber, clay, wood, and jewelry. Um, the, the program has been in business for 45 years. And so it's, um, it's a pretty cool thing. And um, so my, my work changed, changed somewhat uh, when I transitioned from uh, living in Maine to coming down to the South and living here in North Carolina and taking on, taking on my job. Um, I was a self-employed studio artist and my focus was wearables. And that was in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and however, since I've been teaching, since I've been full-time faculty and not necessarily um, depending on um, textile sales, artwork sales as my living, I've, I've turned more to a kind of a fine art approach, still hand weaving. Um, for example, the work that we're looking at in the slideshow is, um, is hand woven substrate, uh, I would call it almost, I'm treating it almost like a canvas. Um, although a lot of planning goes in before the weaving for the warp materials and then during the weaving and then off loom, um, more processes happen in terms of dyeing and sometimes stitching. And um, these end up being uh, wall pieces, stretched and framed wall pieces. So they kind of behave like paintings. So that's what I've been doing um, for the past, I mean, at least a decade. Um, and, and then my other specialty is called Anjule weaving, which, so if, you, if you're looking at these images um, in the slides, you can see some kind of horizontal waving action. Um, that is uh, what Anjule, warp Anjule um, does. It makes it, the, the threads in the weave are actually 
waving and undulating, um, but are interlaced, you know, tightly into the weave. So that's kind of unique. It's not what I'm going to be teaching at Aramont, um, of course. This um, coming spring, I will teach intro to weaving. Um, I was scheduled to teach that last spring, but of course, uh, so this is the rescheduled session. Um, and I've, I teach intro to weaving at, at the college every single fall. So I've been, I've been teaching this level for a really long time, in addition to intermediate and advanced techniques. Um, but I, I love teaching intro to weaving. Um, I have noticed that I think there's a real, um, there's a, there's a, like a, a reignited interest in weaving. And so I'm, I'm really excited to, to be there and be available to sort of pull people into the field with us. Um, so yeah, uh, May 30th to June 4th, intro to weaving. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Amy T. Hey everyone. Thanks so much for having me, Aramont and Kelsey, and thanks everyone tuning in. My name is Amy Taylor, and I'm a natural dyer and textile artist based in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I originally grew up in Los Angeles and started university at a traditional liberal arts college in DC and kind of bopped around for a while and wound up transferring to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I majored in visual and critical studies, which is pretty much art theory and criticism. And after graduating there, I thought I was gonna be an agent for artists. I still didn't consider myself an artist. So I briefly went to business school and promptly dropped out and moved back to Chicago and really missed my studio practice and having access to a studio that wasn't my 300 square foot apartment <laughs> and uh, through a sort of funny circumstance of events I was introduced to Will Street Arts Center here in Chicago where I've been a member and teaching since about 2011 and I started taking a synthetic dye class there and got really really into it and was in every open studio and just kind of hit the ceiling of what I could learn with synthetic dyes. It's once you master the recipe, that's kind of it. And a Kenny Cohn, who's also been an instructor at Aramont, was teaching natural dye classes at Little Street at the time, and that just seemed sort of the next step. And I took her class, totally fell in love, took her class three more times because I was just blindly following her recipes, not really understanding what I was doing or why, but I enjoyed it. And so I was playing with shibori and color and form. And sometime in the fourth class, I was like, oh, it clicked. Like, this is why we moored into our fabric. And I was hooked ever since. And Shortly after working under a chemi, I had a natural dye residency in Oaxaca, Mexico, where I got to study under Elsa Sanchez Diaz, also known as Denido Amano. And it was really important for me because under a chemi, I learned rules and methodology and this really sort of structured way of dying. And under Elsa, it was much more, throw it in and see what happens. It's gonna work, don't worry about it. <laughs> and so I learned all these new methods and materials and history and importance. And shortly after that, I got to take a three-day workshop through Maiwa up in Vancouver, and I got to study under the legendary Michelle Garcia. And under him, I learned the chemistry of natural dyes. I had never considered natural dyes to be a science. And it totally blew my mind. And so between 
the three of them, I really had this greater grasp and understanding of the history, chemistry, and artistry. I knew that this is what I wanted to do and study forever. And I wound up starting a small business making naturally dyed underwear designed to cover your butts all day, and which I love and still love doing, but thanks to COVID and some studio safety issues, I really wasn't able to access my studio for a long time. So I had to pivot my business and I had been wanting to make natural dye kits for a really long time. And so I was like, cool, how can I expand my teaching and give people access and education from home? And that's where we are today. And I forgot to mention, I will be teaching at Aromont at the end of October. My class is Plants, Bugs, and Mineral Salts, an Introduction to Natural Dyes. Uh, and yeah, and here we are. <laughs> so each of y'all are scheduled to teach an introductory workshop this year at Aramont. So that's how we're going to frame today's conversation um, around teaching and how it relates to your work and your studio practice. So we're going to jump right in. Um, so the first question I have for y'all is, as well-established artists in your own fields, how does teaching the basics of your craft to beginners influence how you approach your own work? And anybody can jump in at any time. Yeah, I've been teaching intro for, for so very long now, it seems, um, that I can speak to that probably pretty, pretty easily. Number one um, is technical precision. So, you know, when you're teaching an intro class, it's necessary to break down all of the steps in really clear, methodical, you know, um, steps and communicate that clearly. And um, back in the studio, <laughs> when I'm back in the studio, you know, it reminds me, I can draw on that. And it's, a lot of it is kind of like a, like a walk what you talk kind of situation. Um, so, so that has definitely impacted my, my practice. And, and also kind of more broadly is just pra is patience in general. Obviously, you know, patience is required to be um, a good teacher, especially with beginners. Um, and it's something uh, to, you know, not to forget even having patience with yourself in the studio. So, um, really good lessons that I get to keep learning and relearning every time I teach intro. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of what Amy P just said kind of really resonates with me too in terms of uh, you know teaching beginners. Uh, I think you you get to a point in the craft where um, you know everything's working for you and you understand how the tools work and and why the cuts that you're doing are working, and then you start teaching beginners. And all of a sudden you have to be able to explain to people why that is. And it, you know, it really forces you to kind of examine your approaches and what's working and what's not working. And like Amy was saying, break that up into, into small steps that people can understand, you know, clear explanations. And then, yeah, that just feeds back into my practice and makes me better and better. Um, you know, I, I also, I really get a lot of enjoyment out of teaching beginners. Um, you know, I mean, I'd say, well, one thing that I forgot to mention in my, uh, introduction statement there is that um, beginning in the fall of 2019 I started developing a uh, wood turning program at a community wood shop here called the Denver Tool Library um, and before uh, COVID got started there in March 2020 we were on track to be teaching um, you know two or three beginner classes every month there was there was that level of demand for it and um, yeah that, that was just something that um, you know, kind of really fed into my practice too, in terms of it just, it just kept me enthusiastic about making the work, um, you know, because it's, it's such a joy to see um, somebody that's brand new to the craft, get in there and see how fun it is. And, you know, experience their first moment of the gouge really working for them and, and, you know, making those, you know, shavings that, you know, just fly off the piece on the lathe. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting back to it this year. <laughs> and 
I agree with everything both of you just said. <laughs> and I also feel like for me, because we get so many students with such different backgrounds and levels of understanding and learning styles, it's a really fun challenge to be able to explain the process and the steps and the whys in 10 different ways for 10 different learning styles. And it really makes me understand my craft at a much deeper level. And in addition to that, I think most teachers, we really want our students to love these things that we love. And that requires them to have a strong foundation and to feel excited and curious. And so I want to give my students a really like happy, fun understanding so that they can explore further either with or without me without getting frustrated. In y'all's experience, is there something universal that happens when you teach a room full of students that are new to the craft? What is it like to experience someone else's aha moment? Well, I, I think one of my favorite aha moments that a lot of people tend to have in wood turning um, is a lot of people are surprised. Uh, you know, I, I hear a lot, you know, like, oh, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't as afraid as I thought I would be. That wasn't as hard. Um, you know, a lot of people are surprised to find out that it's, it's more of a finesse skill. It's, you know, it's not about strength. Um, you know, you don't have to be very physically strong to be able to be a good wood turner. It's all about finesse and understanding, um, you know, the angles of the gouges meeting the wood and, and being able to, you know, kind of um, have a sensitivity to that and kind of feel things. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of people, um, I, I think in just about every beginner class that I've taught, you know, at least half the class says something along the lines of like, oh, wow, you know, that was, that was really meditative and relaxing. You know, I, I was really surprised. I thought, you know, I thought I'd be afraid of like the wood flying off at me or, you know, feel like it was dangerous. But, um, you know, a, a lot of people are just, uh, you know, really, I mean, within a very short time of, of stepping in front of the lathe for the first time, you, you can see people really begin to enjoy it. And it's always fun to be a part of that. It's a rush. It's one of my favorite parts of teaching because you, you can see it happen. And then they just take off running and you're like, yes, you're into it. I love it. Um, and I, it's really sort of magical to watch that click happen and have everything that you've been trying to explain kind of all makes sense at once in a wave. <laughs> <clears throat> the type of weaving that I um, primarily teach is, is floor loom weaving. Um, and honestly, you know, getting proficient and confident on the floor loom from absolutely, you know, ground zero does take some time. It really takes several goes at it. Um, and luckily in my, in my college, um, teaching, I, I get to see that because I'm with students for two whole years. So I get to see them, um, actually arrive at that place of confidence and proficiency. Um, and I just, I can recall like more than once just kind of walking through the studio at anywhere I'm teaching, um, and the looms are all going, you know, just like, right throwing the shuttles and all this activity and, and I just it's like this sensation just comes over me of just like wow I mean no I'm so grateful that you know and I feel like pleasantly like responsible for this happening <laughs> <laughs> like oh I brought all these people to this place and they're doing this thing and that feels just super fulfilling to me yeah. Yeah. I remember when it, I, I took a weaving class and it took me a while, but I eventually was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so 
bouncing off of that, um, when you were first starting out in your respective crafts, do you remember having that moment or that experience with an instructor or a mentor that still resonates with you? There's a, the, the one, the, the primary sort of professor student exchange that has never left my mind from when I was at RISD. It wasn't in um, beginning weaving. It was sort of halfway through the program. So it was in a more advanced class, but um, I, and it was kind of like, it was like this tough love situation that really worked for me. And I don't, I don't know, maybe I've, Maybe I've taken that on a little bit in my own um, teaching, but I was like whining and complaining about this assignment, which was um, we were actually assigned to design fabrics and enter them into this like competition, this student design competition. And I was trying and trying and I just felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. And I was like, oh, Lisa Skull was her name. I was like, Lisa, I can't do it. Look, I'm not coming up anything like me, me. And she was just so sort of hardcore. She was like, look, she's like, you, you're a great student at a great school and just make a statement. She was basically like, stop whining and, and do it, you know? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and um, I, I did. And, and I ended up winning that competition, which was pretty cool. But I feel like, that it wouldn't have happened without Lisa just like kicking me in the butt. <laughs> For me, it was a little bit more like student and teaching. I was a studio assistant for a chemicone during a two week intensive natural dye and katazome workshop. And she was talking about her teaching philosophy and how it's imperative if we want our craft to continue, people have to know how to do it. And before that point, I had experienced a fair amount of gatekeeping of information and knowledge within the natural dye world. And I, I see it starting to change, but there was definitely a period where you kind of had to fight to get people to share and, or like you had to pay for classes. And Akemi's philosophy was about sharing information. And I, I felt her philosophy was rooted in generosity and that gatekeeping has no place in this field. And it really changed the way that I approach art and the way that I teach and the way that I share my knowledge because I agree with her so tremendously that the more people who fall in love with this practice, the better the practice will be. Um, I, I think for me, I mean, there's, there's so many, uh, so many aha moments that I can choose from. I mean, I've been, I've been so fortunate to study with, with so many great wood turners. Um, but I, you know, I think one of the, one of the experiences that really stands out is, you know, I, like I talked about after I was done with the community college program, um, kind of the first, uh, first class I had with one of the, uh, you know, masters in the wood turning field was a, a week long workshop at Anderson Ranch Arts Center with Christian Bouchard. And, um, you know, during that week, it, it was it was such a wonderful class because it was totally free form. He, we basically all got together Sunday night and he said, I want you to guys to like sketch up whatever wild ideas you have and we'll figure out how to do it. So, um, you know, I, I did that and, and wound up making, um, it's kind of hard to describe, but if you imagine like a football sawed in half 
And then on that flat half of the football, there's, you know, kind of three um, depressions carved out that were, you know, it was all wood turning. So, you know, during that week, um, you know, I learned about off center wood turning, uh, learned about split wood turnings where you create an object with a um, sacrificial board glued um, in the middle. And then you take that out, you know, that was kind of how we got the half of football shape, but the, uh, the overall lesson there and uh, you know, something that I've kind of just uh, ran with ever since then was I, I always like for my ideas to be kind of beyond my current level of execution. So it's like, um, you know, I feel like what I like to do is dream up something crazy and then figure out how I'm going to do it. And, and that was, uh, that, that week with Christian Burchard was kind of where, where that whole, um, influence started. That's interesting. Thinking about achieve constantly achieving those aha moments by pushing yourself a little bit over your comfort zone with each new project that you start. That's really neat. Yeah, I love uh, that. I love that, Chris. It's like, this is all life learning, you know, all of our crafts. We, in, a, in several lifetimes, we wouldn't learn um, everything that there is to learn. Um, it's great to keep on pushing. Yeah. So what advice do y'all have for makers as they develop their own voice and their own style as it relates to your discipline or media and also the larger craft world? Um, I was going to say like one, one thing that, um, you know, I, I think is really helpful for wood turners to do. And, um, you know, this is, this is something I've gotten from Jack Vessery out of all the workshops I've been in with him and being his assistant is uh, one thing that we really don't do in the wood turning world that every other artist does is make multiples of things. Um, you know, a lot of wood turners, um, you know, are getting into this as, uh, you know, again, because of the lack of BFA programs, we probably have like a, you know, higher percentage of people that are getting into this as kind of a retirement hobby. And so that whole um, art school experience is missing from them. Um, you know, but one of the things that, that Jack taught us in all his classes is the power of making multiples. In other words, you, you know, you pick a particular shape, you know, whether it's like a vase shape or a bowl shape, or, you know, there's several classical shapes, um, you know, from like Greek pottery onward, you just pick something and you run with it and you, you do lots and lots of them. And I think, I think that's the biggest thing that, um, you know, wood turners are missing that would benefit you know, them from adopting that in their practice is just do lots and lots of one thing. Um, that's how you learn. And, you know, the way, the way that Jack always described it was that, you know, he used the analogy of like a ceramics class at a university and, and the professor would divide the class into two groups. And, you know, he'd tell the one group, you know, like uh, one half of the class, I want you to spend this semester you know, thinking about and making like the one, you know, perfect pot, you're going to make the best pot you've ever made. And, you know, it's going to be wonderful. And, and the other half of the class gets assigned to just throw the same thing over and over again. And, you know, invariably at the end of the semester, the class of the half of the class that did better was the one that was doing the repetition. You know, it's just, you know, getting the, the, the time at the lathe or the pottery wheel or whatever in to, to kind of just um, because because with all of these art disciplines, there there is that that learning curve that has to go on on the technical side. And um, just just repeating the things over and over again will, you know, kind of feed into your work and, and eventually, you know, become part of your uh, you know, that, that's how you make something yours. Uh, you know, a lot of times people, when they first start off, they're kind of obsessed with, you know, like finding their own thing or, you know, doing something super unique. And I think the way you get to that point is by just, you know, getting in there and um, working on the basics as much as you can. That's great advice. Amy T, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say that I, I recommend that students be nice to themselves. Um, I've noticed, so you sort of in like the first foot in the door, people understand that they don't understand anything yet. And so they're very open and receptive and patient and just experimenting. And then it happens sort of starting the step right after that that I, I see a lot of students being really hard on themselves because their piece isn't perfect quickly enough or good enough quickly enough. 
And I think this is really exacerbated by like social media and seeing all these things all these people do. And I always tell students that part of the treasure of a handmade object is seeing these perceived blemishes. It shows the human behind it. If we want something to be perfect, at this point we have the technology that it's cheaper, faster, easier to have a computer do it. So let's embrace the handmadeness by like putting the human fingerprint on it and just showing the human behind the piece. Yeah, I think that you're right. Even, I mean, I have found myself, you know, watching those super sped up videos of people throwing pots, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, if I, you know, at some point you think if you watch enough of those, you could like hop right on there and do it too. <laughs> totally, totally. I once met a man in Kyoto. He had been practicing sort of following up with Chris was saying of repetition. He had been practicing this one art form for 60 years and he was still like, oh no, I'm not a master. Right. <laughs> Amy P, what are your thoughts? I, I so agree with what Amy was talking about, um, particularly like the evidence of the hand and allowing the evidence of the hand to, to show, to be evident in our craft work. Um, Sometimes I witness students producing fabric that, that they might be a little bit disappointed in because when it comes off the loom, it doesn't look like um, it came out of, you know, the, the fabric store. Like, you know, it didn't come off of a, a mechanized loom in pristine, perfect condition. And so, you know, I it's important to impress upon them the importance of, well, that's exactly why we're doing it. You know, machines do that and that's great. We'll let them do that. And we do this. Um, and, and another thing, it's kind of related to that is I try to, I really try to impress upon my students and I'm not sure if it, if it ever really gets through or not, but um, I also witness sometimes the piece comes off the loom and students are initially like a little bit disappointed. Like, oh, the, you know, the something something is not perfect and the, the something something's not quite what I wanted and this thing could, this detail could have been better. And, and just a little bit of like, oh. And I really work to try to turn that around and it's because I truly believe it myself that this is a wonderful thing that the object is not perfect this time because you get to try it again and again and again and again. You know, um, if we arrived at perfection very early on, that would, that'd be the end of the career. I mean, that'd be the mm -hmm. end. Right. So I just, I just really try to spin that into a positive of you're right. It's never going to be perfect. And that's awesome. <laughs> we keep yeah. going. Yeah, I, I took a, we, a beginner's weaving class a couple of years ago, and I could, when, I, when it came off the loom, I could see all of my tiny mistakes, but I realized that all of my mistakes were made when I was talking to the other women in the class. And so it, I, I began to understand it as this like really beautiful document of a conversation happening instead oh. of mistakes, right? That's awesome. I love how you are t turning that around into something positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So with the, re with the remaining uh, time that we have, we have a lot of really great questions coming in. So I'm going to jump right into them. Um, so someone in the audience uh, asks, and I love this question, um, what new craft would you take on if you, if, you know, what new craft would you jump into if you had the chance? Glass blowing. Glass blowing. I'm going to learn glass blowing, yeah, and it good. seems really intimidating, but I love it. And I've known a bunch of glass blowers, and they've always been really cool people. And I think the big prohibition has been just like access to studios. But once everything opens up again, 
game to go. <laughs> wow, that sounds so terrifying to me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> heat and fire and like no and whoa and having to move fast whoa no um probably woodworking I would be too afraid I'm really bad with hand tools and um <laughs> like maybe pottery I think I have had visions of actually a certain I've had visions of a body of work that was um wheel thrown um vases I've never even like touched a wheel I know nothing <laughs> But I would try it. What about you, Chris? Um, I, can I steal Amy's answer and say glass blowing? No, that that was a great <laughs> one. I, you know, I um, I actually I, I have tried a little bit of pottery. Um, last year I did take like a an intro to ceramics course through uh, the Denver Rec Centers. Actually, have it here, and and it was a lot more difficult than I thought, you know, I thought, you know, cause like, um, in a lot of my, like on my own website and some other, um, promotional materials that I have, I often describe wood turning as being like throwing pottery on a wheel. You know, I, I think I say something like, except my wheel is horizontal instead of vertical or, you know, <laughs> I can't remember if I'm saying that, but you know, you know what I'm saying? So I thought, well, you know, yeah, this is, you know, kind of seems like ceramics or kind of, you know, like, like we're kind of brothers in the craft here, you know, they're kind of doing more or less the same thing, you know, spinning things around, making axial forms. <laughs> and um, it, <laughs> I, I was blown away by like how little the wood turning skills transferred over, you know, I mean, there was, I was totally starting from ground zero on that. Um, but I loved it, you know, I mean, I, if I had time, I'd, I'd try a little bit of everything. But um, when you first asked the question, and before I heard the other responses, what I was thinking of was either blacksmithing, you know, because there's, there's a lot of carryover between that and the woodworking world, you know, um, knowing at least a little bit of basic blacksmithing allows you to make a couple of uh, wood turning tools that are not um, commercially available, like uh, the guys that are using the um, pole laves that are, you know, foot operated lays, uh, their tools are these, these little hooks that are basically like a gouge on its side. And, and there's not really anywhere to commercially buy those. So if you want to get into that style of wood turning, you have to learn a little bit of blacksmithing. So I'd love to do that at some point. Um, or the other thing that occurs to me is like, um, I've been, uh, you know, this, this fall, I haven't been doing a lot of creating new work and I've been kind of reading up about different technologies and everything. And, and I feel, I feel kind of left behind in terms of some of the technological advancements going on. Uh, you know, me and, uh, everybody here, we were, we were joking about how this was kind of my first official zoom meeting today. I have my little, you know, background set, set up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so yeah, this is my first time doing, doing a zoom call other than with friends. Friends. So anyway, I mean, if I had like, you know, like unlimited time and money, what I'd really like to learn more about is um, photography and some kind of digital art, you know, where I'm actually like, you know, um, like I've been looking into the uh, program Unity which is a, a software engine that does like a lot of the, I don't know a lot about this, so I'm sure I'm going to get these terms wrong, but it does like a lot of the 3D rendering for um, video games. And then they're thinking that, you know, coming up in the future, it's going to actually move into um, like real world virtual reality applications, you know, whether that's like industrial design or whatever. So, I mean, it would be, I, it would be really interesting for me to learn more about that at some point. Cool. Um, so I have another audience question from David. Um, he asks if you could talk a little bit about how you've adapted teaching online in the time of COVID, if that's something that you've been doing. Yeah, it's hard. Teaching online is so different than teaching in person. And I'll say, like, sort of referring back to the earlier question is, I miss those aha moments with students. It's much harder for those to translate on screen. Mm -hmm. um, but a big thing that I've done, especially because we no longer have a group studio for students to like work with studio pots, uh, I've started teaching natural dyes using kitchen supplies so that people don't have to make a big investment in dye only pots, dye only da 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 da. So we can use like onion skins and turmeric and 
leftover coffee grinds and avocado pits and skins and natural pH modifiers like vinegar, cream of tartar, baking soda. Um, so, I mean, because synthetic dyes weren't discovered until 1856. So all color on all fabric in the whole world ever before 1856 was done using natural dyes. So there's, there's a whole world <laughs> of, of materials that we can explore. Totally. That's so brilliant, Amy. Um, like, yeah, I mean, natural colorants are ancient. Mm -hmm. Weaving is ancient. Mm -hmm. um, when we had to shift to 100% online last March, I was in the middle of intro to weaving. And like, how do you do that? And so the major obstacle was the equipment and the facilities. Mm -hmm. You know, my students don't have a fancy floor loom at home and, you know, all, all of the accoutrement and everything. Um, but I mean, weaving's been going on a lot longer than, you know, um, floor looms have been being built. So I actually, this was, it was really, really, really hard. It was really challenging, but I had students um, build a backstrap loom, which is, um, it, that, it's like very, very primitive, simple, um, a loom basically made out of like sticks, literally sticks and strings. And you just use your body to create tension um, for those folks who aren't familiar. Um, so we kind of, we also, um, Amy, like revisited the ancients to, um, to carry on our craft without our fancy tools and studios. And uh, I, I haven't really been, uh, you know, I, I did like one kind of remote uh, teaching session this year. And that was, uh, there, there's these, um, another thing that we have in the wood turning world that I don't know if a lot of other art disciplines have is uh, there's these wood turning clubs that meet once a month. And it, those used to be in-person meetings where, you know, each club would have a lathe up at the front of it and somebody would come through and do a demonstration, you know, and then it's, you know, 40 or 50 people in the audience watching and then they ask you questions. So um, I basically did one of those remotely in June by going to the um, the club's location and they had all the cameras set up but I, I never quite you know got like cameras for live demos set up in my own studio yet you know I mean I think I've spent the whole year thinking like oh you know I mean we're gonna get COVID under control like any month now and you know uh, if, I, if, I, if, I, if, if I invest in all these cameras and everything am I gonna do that and then you know like this is uh you know, and then we'll be right back to in-person learning. So, so I spent like way too many months, like with that line of thought. And I think, you know, like now, even now that we can kind of hopefully see the end in sight, I think this idea of remote learning is here to stay. So that is kind of one of my projects for the next little while is mm -hmm. getting the additional cameras set up to be able to, you know, teach live session, live remote sessions in the studio. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of, for some of that, we kind of suffer from the, the same thing that, Amy P was just talking about in that, you know, like um, a lot of the appeal of the classes that I taught at the Denver Tool Library was that we have all the tools there now, you know, I mean, we're up to having five lathe stations with all the tools and everything to go along with them. So, you know, somebody that getting into woodworking and, and, you know, building up your shop or studio at home can be a pretty expensive proposition as well. And so, um, you know, for, for teaching beginners, that's, uh, that's kind of something they're relying on is being able to go, you know, to a facility in person that has all those tools to try it out and see if they like it. Uh, so any of the online teaching is, you know, by its very nature, not really geared towards beginners, you know, it's, it's people that, you know, are kind of a little further down the, the path and want, you know, like a a seminar on a specific topic or whatever but yeah i mean i think uh i think after being stubborn about it for all year i'm going to finally go ahead and, and get the studio set up for that because uh i think even even after we come out of the pandemic um it, it's here to stay you know people are going to want those those remote teaching sessions yeah we've taken a page at aramont out of the wood turning studio and we have been putting and installing cameras and tvs in the studio so that people can see what the instructors are doing and being able to still safely distance 
um, which it's smart and it'll, it'll be useful for us even when we get out of this. Well, and I think an opportunity that opened up with teaching online is national access. Uh, so, you know, when, when I teach here in Chicago, I get all Chicago, maybe some Wisconsin, some suburbs, but in one of my more recent classes, I had one person in California and another person in New York joining us for the class. And that was really cool. Yeah. There are silver linings out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I've got another question from the audience for y'all. Um, this one is from Vernon. Hi, Vernon. Um, how has working as an assistant helped you with your teaching? Like being experiences, being an assistant, you know, in the past and now that yeah. you're a lead teacher. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's, I think it's important for teachers and assistants to be able to anticipate the students' needs, I think, to some degree. Um, you, being familiar with the process, for one thing, um, so that you can anticipate the things that are going to go wrong, the probable um, stumbling points for the students, and just be prepared for that. So, um, assistantships. I think are a really great lesson in in witnessing all of those like potential <laughs> snags um, kind of, and not having to be like 100% responsible for it because yeah, you're not, not being in the hot seat. <laughs> right. Right. So after um, building up quite a repertoire of, Oh, I've seen this go wrong. I've seen that go wrong. I didn't necessarily have to deal with it, but uh, sooner or later, um, that assistant is going to be very ready to teach themselves, Vernon. I think <laughs> I know who this is. <laughs> At Atlanta, it's, it's so important in learning how to manage a classroom. You know, when you have 20 different people with 20 different needs and you're one person, how do you navigate that to make sure all of your students are hitting their goals and learning what they came in to learn? And as a studio assistant, you can get that experience while also watching how someone more seasoned than you navigates it. And so, when it inevitably happens in your classroom, you can say, oh, this was done really successfully, or, oh, the way this person handled it did not go great. I already know now not to do that. <laughs> totally. Yeah, um, I really agree with like everything that's already been said by Amy and Amy. Um, you know, I mean, you just get, it, it, it's a really invaluable experience being an assistant because I mean, in my class and in, in my case, having been a uh, Jack Bessery's assistant three times. And I mean, when I started being his assistant, he was already a master teacher at that point. You know, I mean, I think, I think he'd been doing it for, you know, teaching classes at Aeromont for, you know, 15 or 20 years by that point. And, and so just, you know, just being able to kind of be right there and see how somebody that's such a seasoned teacher, you know, kind of keeps the momentum of the class going and, um, you know, gives everybody a little bit of, you know, what they, what they came to the class for. Uh, yeah, it was, it was really just an invaluable experience. And um, the other thing I really appreciate about Jack is, um, you know, in, in, a, in the woodworking field, especially, we can kind of, we can kind of veer down a path that's like too technical, you know, and everybody kind of wants to like, you know, geek out over the tools and hey, you know, what angle do you sharpen your gouge at and this and that. <laughs> and, um, you know, Jack does a really good job of um, 
you know, bringing in kind of the more interesting stories, the, you know, the stories about like form and design and, and more like the why of what we, why we do what we do. And so that's something I hope to bring to my class too. You know, I mean, it's going to be maybe a little more challenging in a beginner setting because we do have to go over those technical things and get everybody that technical base. Um, but I sure hope I'm able to um, give to my students a little bit of the, you know, more, um, you know, more art, artistic or, you know, kind of interesting backstories that go into why we, why we do what we do. Yeah. Well, do y'all have any last thoughts on, on this topic before we wrap up today? Famous last words. I just wanted to say that I am really looking forward to getting back to Aramont and back to teaching at the craft schools in person. Um, I, I mean, I am a full-time teacher. However, I also, in the summer times, for many years, I've taught at various craft schools. And it's, um, it's such an awesome compliment to my um, to my full-time position and to my studio practice. And I love meeting people so much. And, um, you know, a lot of that happens at the craft schools. So, so ready for COVID to go away and <laughs> get back out there um, and be together. Yeah, I, I can't wait either. Um, you know, it's, it's such an honor to have been asked to teach at Aeromont after I've learned so much there. And, uh, you know, my, my weeks in the summer at Aeromont are kind of always the highlight of my year. And, uh, you know, lo looking forward to it for, for two years now <laughs> has been kind of one of the little things uh, keeping me going during, you know, kind of a, a time that was pretty challenging to be an artist. So, yeah, I can't, I can't wait. I, I just love, you know, meeting new people and sharing craft with them. So really looking forward to it and hope to see some of you there. Uh, it's, I echo everything Amy and Chris are saying, and both having taken classes at Aeromont and taught at Aeromont, it's undeniable that it's just a really magical, special place, and I cannot wait to get back in the studio and have everyone's arms covered in blue. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we we miss y'all too. We cannot wait to to have all of our teachers and assistants and students back on campus. Like y'all bring the magic with you. Believe me. Um, so thank y'all so much. This has been an awesome discussion. Um, early next week, the recording of today's talk will be made available online. Thanks again for joining us for the first roundtable of this new year. Um, many thanks again, Chris, Amy, and Amy for sharing your, your work and your ideas and your experiences. Um, please visit our website and social media to stay tuned for upcoming um, instructor roundtable panels in the future. Um, as a reminder, the registration for our 2021 National Workshop season opens on February 1st online and by phone. Come take a class with these awesome folks, y'all. Um, we hope you'll join us again, and on behalf of everyone here at Aramont, Stay safe and stay creative. We can't wait to see y'all. Bye. Thanks for having me. See you. Thank Bye. you.